Okay, right. So moving on to the next topic, and I think we've a lot of the panels today, there's, a, there's been this huge focus on data. So I think even more appropriate with these sort of experts on stage here that we can really tap into it from a different perspective. Obviously, data, sports data analytics is so vital. Um, and I think we're going to sort of tap into a few areas looking at from an injury prevention, from player valuations, team strategy, uh, ticket pricing, and then also sports betting. Um, so I'm going to start by asking each of our esteemed panel to give an introduction. Um, Roberto, this is effectively your house, so I'm sorry I'm asking you to do an introduction to everyone. I think everyone knows you, but if you'd like to go through to each of you, just giving a background on yourself, your role, um, and that would be great first. Yes, uh, hello everyone again, very familiar faces. Uh, my name is Roberto Martinez, I'm the head coach of the Red Devils and technical director of the RBFA. I've been here in Belgium enjoying the food and the company for six years, so very much feeling at home. Thank you, Roberto. Cedric? Yeah, hi. Um, same thing, familiar faces every time. Um, so Cedric van Brandt again. I, uh, I'm an Olympian. I uh, participated in the 2004-2008 Olympic Games in 400 and 4x4. Uh, and today I'm the CEO and General Secretary of the Belgian Olympic Committee. And in between my professional athlete career and uh, now back in the sports business and sports administration, I had some time with uh, sports CRM systems as well. So there is some background. Thank you, Cedric. Erwin. Hi, everyone. My name is Erwin Konings. Um, I work in the National Cycling Federation in support of all disciplines of our performance stuff, going from BMX racing to road cycling, everything in between. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you, Erwin. And Chris. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chris O'Loughlin. Um, I've been in Belgium now for nine years. I'm originally started in the football coaching, and I'm now in my fourth season as sports director of Union saint gilloise Super, thank you. Um, look, I think I was invited here today because my wife is Belgian, so that's the reason why I've got onto stage with you guys. Um, right, we're going to tap into conversation. So, Roberto, I'm going to start with you. So, from a player's perspective, and obviously now an esteemed coach, the tracking of players in multiple countries for scouting, selection, and injury is obviously vital. How much influence can the RBFA have in collecting and understanding the data on players to have the biggest impact for, obviously, the tournament ahead? Well, I think it's a bit of a common sense approach. Uh, if I give you a little bit the, the way it changes, five years ago we had to get on the phone every almost once a month and in a conversation try to get the feeling of the information of the performance of a player. Now, every Monday after every game, we will get uh, all the physical data of that player. We'll have leading up the five days to each game and then you can create your own ways of measuring that because it's not the same the work that is done in a league like in the Premier League to Spain to Italy to France to Germany so you put your own filters and you create a little bit of a pattern not to compare stats from country or, or, or league to league is more the player over the course of two three years so it's a very very much a uh, way to create a process rather than having that subjective conversation and knowing that a player is feeling well that probably as we all know the human beings our brains don't retain all the information it's very difficult for all of us to keep track of those informations even if you write them down on a paper now the data allows you to create real trends and ways of developing and managing the the moment of a player yeah and so focused towards team selection which is obviously coming up Yes, uh, and I think that's a little bit, uh, I was hearing some of the questions in the, in the previous panel, is, is the context of data. Data in itself has got no power, it's got no value whatsoever. It's the context that you give it. So data should never encourage a discussion, it's the opposite. The discussion is there and then data gives you the uh, total objective answer. So but that's what's important, is that you don't get confused and when you get data there's a lot of noise what you need to find is the real track and real number and the real reason why you are getting data in front of you. So it's important that you don't lose too much time with confusing data and you find what you really, really need. Yeah, super, thank you. Um, look, Cedric, question for you. So I want to ask you from also from an athlete perspective, um, you were at two Olympic Games, uh, where the use of data for injury prevention and strategy when you competed was obviously crucial. Um, but how aware during your career were you of that utilization of data back then? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm of the same generation of uh, Wesley and, and, and Manu. 
So, um, and I found it very interesting. And ju ju first, just to, to go back to what Martin, uh, Roberto said, it's really how do you use data and in what context? Because there's so much data in, in selections, but it's different for a coach or for an analyst that wants to uh, do TV analysis or for an athlete in an early stage of your career, you want to get better, or your late stage of your career where you want to extend your performance and you extend your career. And I only got in contact with data actually in the latter phase of my career. I had a very heavy injury and I was very lucky to be one of the, I would say, one of the first athletes to be uh, in the magic hands of Lieven Maaschalk. And uh, Lieven took me together with Jean-Pierre Meersman to the Milan Lab, which uh, in 2007 was, uh, well, and, uh, Roberto knows of course, was world class and almost never seen in the world of sports in general, uh, where I was tested. And I was uh, made aware of data in my daily training. So how to measure things, uh, how to measure my recovery, even on the mental side, where Wesley made some funny jokes, but it is possible with neurofeedback, etc., to see if there's some mental stress. And my biggest problem was mental stress. So with some uh, exercises and, of course, changing my training patterns based on what we measured and then did measurements in between. Uh, I could extend my career and have one more Olympic Games and uh, extend it to 2010. And this kind of data uh, or this kind of analysis today, we have it just every day on, in training, in, in, in GPS devices, in, in whoops around our, shoulder, uh, around our wrist. So we evolved so much, for both for the athlete and for the, the staff around it, to just make an athlete more performant at the moment that they have to. Yeah. Look, so from your current role then, look, and, the, and your role at the Federation with so, so many NGBs, sort of how are you utilising and focus on data now from the Olympic Committee perspective? Well, the very honest answer, I've only been there for seven months. Uh, we're just getting started. We rely very much on guys like Roberto, uh, people in the, in the Sailing Federation with uh, uh, Emma, and that really, or guys like Serge that really believe in data. Um, so we are right now scanning the landscape, looking where as an Olympic committee where there are some gaps and where we can help those federations, make the federations learn from each other. But unfortunately, we're not much further than this. But of course, we don't have the athletes. It's the football federation, the athletics federation. They are in charge of the athletes. And even that is not really true because they're with their clubs, etc. So, but we're trying now to create an ecosystem to share this data. Uh, or to share this, this, the, the, the technology that's out there and just to learn from each other uh, from sport to sport and to, to connect them. Yeah, I mean, Roberto, in your early comments at the start of today's event, you mentioned this point of it's the ability, look, you can be reactive, but how can you go out to be proactive now? And how, how important is it from you and from the Federation and from the Olympic Committee to just have a proactive approach to data and sports? I think, I think it's give it uh, common sense. Uh, technology and data shouldn't be at the start of, of any process. It should be identifying issues, define, identifying the areas that you have to work, and then how you're going to do it. And then is when data becomes really essential to know where you are, to measure where you are, and where you want to get. And then you can establish all sort of the processes. You don't start the other way around. But I think what's important is that you've got the facility to, to find out about new technology. Can you use technology to measure things that they've never been measured before? That's why you become very proactive. You come up with a problem, you come up with an issue into the market, like a data, like today, and someone comes up, yeah, I can provide this, I've got the software, I've got the ways, the means to do it. In general, what it happens is that you are seeing a competitor using some sort of technology and some sort of software that you straight away think, oh, well, that's, that's why they beat us. And that's why they are better than us. And then you become and use that data as a consequence, which it never really gives you an advantage. The advantage is that's what you are. How can you measure it? That's where you want to get. How am I going to get there? And that's where technology and, and data becomes essential. Yeah, look, Chris, you said you've been here, what, nine years now in Belgium, so, but you've had roles in multiple countries. So how have you seen from the sophistication of the increase in use of data, but also from a geographical standpoint in different markets, the shift in how either companies or, or technologies have been utilised? Well, first of all, I mean, I started football coaching in, in Africa, in South Africa, and then moved to the Congo. Um, there definitely was no data back in 2007. The things that we used for to try and encourage performance, I don't think they would be accepted in Western culture. Um, so I, I came to I came to Europe in um, in 2010, 
and I, I moved over to Australia to Melbourne Victory, and that was probably the first time that I actually saw data in, in football. It was very, very uh, low level. We shared a building with um, the Melbourne Storm and the Melbourne footy team, two different um, Australian codes, uh, rugby league and, and Australian rugby, and these guys were just on another level. This was 2012 with data, and myself and the, the manager at the time, we spent some time with them, but we were around them in this building, and the way they had the gym set up and the equipment. And we started to see the use of data. Of course, we had no clue really where it was going. And we had a physical coach who had come over from rugby and he had started uh, doing a little bit of um, heart rate monitors, GPS on the players, a very basic system. But at that time, you just coaches didn't understand it and didn't really take any, any notice and neither did the players. Um, Coming to Belgium, it wasn't really that different, to be honest. Um, when I was at STVV, we brought in Statsport, uh, sorry, um, one, of the, one of the GPS companies, um, and there wasn't a lot of clubs that had it here in Belgium. This was back in 2013. So, and, and even with that, the data wasn't given much value. But fast forward to where we are today, it's absolutely massive. I mean, most coaches, when they make a training exercise, um, and they want to create uh, the parameters of the pitch that they're going to have their tactical or technical content. They work with their physical coach to get the parameters right, to get the, 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 the meters or the intensities that are required for, for match day. Um, we've now even moved it into, um, you know, we do constant testing every couple of weeks. Uh, for example, the, the, the groin bar testing or the hamstring testing, the Nord boards. And we have, um, we have, uh, Every player has, has his limits. We know where we can take them. It's also a great indication for fatigue for the players. So it's just, you know, from where I, when I started to where it is now in terms of performance, it's just on another level. And of course, it's, it's, it, it's going forward and forward. And there's now companies that can predict injuries if, if you feed them your data. And it's, it's just going to different levels. There's obviously some founders in the audience here. And, and I'm, going to, I'm going to ask this as kind of an open question. How ex sort of inviting are you to, to be able to speak to new technologies or to see new technologies directly? I mean, I'll start with you, Chris, because you've just focused on it. Yeah, I suppose I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I get a lot of emails and, and introductions and that, and I'm a bit careful because I also want to, there's something for me that's really important that we be careful we do not become a surveillance culture on the players because they're still human beings made up of emotion. Um, and we need to be very careful that we also don't take the connection element that a manager or a coach has to a player. There's 100% importance with technology and, and monitoring players, but there needs to be a balance. I think for us personally at Union saint gelois we, we're, we're doing very well with our programs. We have an incredibly low injury rate. Um, we've got the systems in place that we are, and I think we need to go forward, and then we need to make an evaluation and see when we need to make that next step. And yes, there is a time to speak to the companies and try to make sure that, um, that, that there's value in what they offer us, and it's, it's, it's not just a, um, a decorated version of what we already have. Okay, look, Erwin, a question there, because sort of Chris mentioned on injury prevention, obviously a focal point for, for sports analytics data. Um, how do you utilize data for sort of rider selection and performance, or f sort of, again, focusing on, on that injury prevention aspect of sports data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, for rider selection, we have in Cycling Federation a talent program, which starts at the age of 12 and goes up to the age of 18. And between these ages, we try to follow up the development of athletes, how they grow, tracking different parameters. First off, we start very general, just measuring speed, agility, that kind of things. And it becomes more and more specific towards different disciplines because cycling is both track sprint, BMX, but it's also very endurance orientated in, in mountain bike or, or road cycling. Those are, in fact, totally different athletes. But in the beginning, we look at them as one group. And as they grow older, we try to pick out elements of excellence towards one of these disciplines or towards another sport. And then testing becomes more and more specific. To the background of benchmarks, we created ourselves. Very discipline specific. And so we try to orientate riders in their 
young to older career towards a, the, the right sport. I, we have examples of riders that start off at an international high level in BMX racing at the age of 12 or 13. And then when they're 15 or 16, we orientate them towards track cycling, one kilometer time trialing, individual pursuit, team pursuit. And in fact, they become very successful there. They perform at the national level, national team. Or we have riders from BMX girls that were world champion in junior category. And five years later, they are in the world championships road cycling. And so we try to follow their evolution using different type of data along their path towards a high level. In fact, when you look at the recruitment of a world champion, Hemco, we once recruited them based on a running test. It's not cycling specific. He come, came there before ever took, taking part in any race. We thought his motivation was OK. We took him on training camp. We looked at some physiological data from just running, we looked at his body composition, and that was the beginning of pushing him towards cycling. So it's more a general view on talent development when you look at data in relation to rider selection. Once riders are involved in training programs or national team structure, we work more with dedicated testing to know something about the underlying training process or physiological capabilities of a rider to develop those things very specifically or on individual based as they need for their discipline or as they need for their specific rider profile. Because even in road cycling, you have guys that can be in front for 200 kilometers and others are just there in the last 50 meters of a 270 kilometer race. They have totally different profiles and identifying those different types of profiles and working towards that profile over many years, that's the way we use data in, in cycling within all our disciplines. Yeah. And obviously, look, cycling being a Olympic discipline of which across winter and summer sports, there are many. How, how so from your point of view, sort of, you know, the ability of almost creating a central innovation hub that you can focus on across all of those disciplines is applicable because you're going to, you know, wearable devices are great for a particular sport, but not every sport. And so how do you have that approach to the mass sports that are cover winter and summer games? Well, for the moment, we, we don't have it yet. So we really collaborate with, with the individual federations. And for example, we have a thorough talks with Belgian cycling, um, exactly what Erwin explained, how young guys can switch from one category to the other. Uh, we also look from the Olympic perspective and of course on where is the, the low hanging fruit to win more medals. Uh, track cycling is one of those. I think uh, BMX racing and track cycling, they combine very well. And then uh, that, that's not my knowledge, but I learned it from them. So now we're having a high performance center almost finished in Zolder, where there's a BMX track and a track uh, together. There we can really Im imply the technology and we can help to play a role. And then we're going to make the bridge to look at, uh, at the winter sports, where uh, how do we go recruit? And that's a role we can play as Olympic Committee a bit easier than cycling as such. We can go look in the short trackers or in the speed skaters. For example, Bart Swings, is a, he's a super good cyclist. Uh, he, he would win a lot of races if he focused a little bit on it. Of course, his focus is on this one and, and, and skiler in, in the summer. So to make the cross links between these, these sports. Um, I think Belgium is not there yet, also due to, of course, our very complex structure in the top sports uh, level with Flanders and uh, with uh, Wallonia to have one central sports uh, technology sports center, but to having several hubs and combining sports, that's what uh, the, the way uh, to, we want to go to. Yeah. And obviously the success of what Sports Tech Belgium can bring is vital to, to all of you in terms of to be able to find source scale companies to be able to be supporting you. Um, Chris, sort of another question on look, from uh, from a scouting perspective of how you're utilizing um, from a club perspective of like right the data when you're selecting on player relating to not only their player valuations but also there's data around from from a scouting perspective. Oh, it's, it's massive. Um, first of all, the data is always a foundation for us. Um, I should probably explain that yes, yeah, so we use data as a foundation 
we still watch the players intensely. We, we watch over six, seven hundred minutes of the player to to understand the style because you need you need to, you know a, a number doesn't give you enough information about a player. Um, and then we we also do a um, intense background research on the player, but. The data where it's helped us, um, and especially over the last few years, um, no one really knew of Union saint was outside of Belgium, and a lot of people had forgotten about the club within Belgium. Um, so you can imagine the amount of names that are sent to us, because a lot of clubs still rely on agents to do their scouting uh, in world football. We don't do that. Um, since October 2020, um, just over 1,600 names have come across my desk, including our own scouting lists. We record, we take in every single name, and what we're able to do with the data is we're able to immediately um, filter the player and, and see where we use a ranking system. Um, that, that's how we use our data. We, we rate the players, and we're able to immediately see if they're anywhere near what we would normally go for. Um, and of course, you need to understand what's behind that rating and ranking system. So, of course, the importance of understanding your data, and and it's it just makes it so easy. Uh, you know, today at lunch for 15 minutes, within 15 minutes, I got 20 profiles sent to me, and I can you know I can within um, half an hour I can know exactly whether there's any interest on the player or, or, or not before we go into the video, the video research or, or the scouting. Um, a great example is in Club Bruges, Casper Nielsen, who moved from uh, from Union saint -Gilles. You know, we signed him from a from a mid-table team in in Denmark. Nobody was looking at him. Um, the, the traditional match sheet stats of uh, assists and goals were not incredible. Um, but we we used our data sets and our data system to identify him, bring him to to Belgium when we were a second division club. And of course, he's now playing Champions League football, and I think he's done really well. And potentially, he goes to the World Cup w with Denmark. And we have a lot of players that you just would never have expected to find based on traditional ways of doing things. And the data has always flagged them, um, but there's still a lot of traditional football work that goes into it, and of course, understanding who the human being is behind all of that. Yeah, it's the money ball scenario, isn't it, from the US. So, Roberto, from your side, from like, obviously the national team, there's a lot of players playing across Europe now. What, how relevant is it to what Chris is doing from an internal Upal Elite perspective of how you're utilizing the work that the Belgian teams are doing to help you in your role? It's exactly the same, obviously. Uh, Chris is very humble, but what he's showing you is that a club like Anderlecht or Club Bruges with a lot of more uh, history with a more pulling power, with more finances. Union have overtaken them in the last three years by having a usage of data for recruitment and for keeping players fit. So you identify two areas where you need to be better than your position and not having to use the same means. We do the same. We've been four years number one in the world and we are competing with nations that they've got 80 million population, 100 million population, 60 million population. So what that means is that we cannot work with the same data that they do. We have to have our own data. Those parameters is what's the data for the national team in Belgium is that we recognize the talent before it shines in the first team. How do we do that is we need to use data to find the outstanding quality of a player, not the perfect player. The perfect player doesn't exist. And that's what data is. Data, if you imagine, data is perfect player. You need to go very specific in what you need to give you exactly what you're looking for, interrogating that data. Then this is our key. As a federation, we cannot waste one talent. I could give you many names, generation of 95, talented players that at that moment, if you would compare their data to current uh, players of the golden generation, you would be very surprised. But because we couldn't support them, because we were not aware that they were so good in certain specifics before they went and showed it, this is finding the roots, how you use data for bridging the gaps and being able to be as competitive as you can. So there's companies like Instat or Huddle that are collecting millions of data points on players across European leagues. Is that something that and you know, access for agents, researchers, journalists to be able to access. Does that help or hinder you in your role? 
help. I, I always believe the more that you share, the more that you put out there, the more competitive that you're going to become. But it's not how, uh, it's how you interrogate the data that it makes it uh, relevant for you. So it's, it's a very much a common approach. You don't start from data. All the information in your table is not going to give you anything. You need to have a doubt and then look the data to answer it at, at any level. Okay, um, Erwin, with sort of the Peloton Swifts of the world that have provided the individual rider now with so much data, um, there's obviously an argument over virtual data versus actual data. Um, sort of what's, what would be your view on this? Uh, first of all, riding on Swift or whatever is, is fun to do. <laughs> and that's good. It's good that it's there. It, it's an easy way to have an insight in broad public's data. But when you compare it to real life cycling, the interaction between riders, the interaction with the environment, the implementation of some characteristics of riders when riding on Swift, for instance, is not complete. You can measure power output. It's an important parameter, but when you want to integrate it, for example, aerodynamic characteristics of a rider, it's kind of tricky. <laughs> and it's the balance between those two that will determine how fast you can ride outdoors. So when you have a very big guy riding on Zwift and can produce lots of power output, it's not necessarily a talented rider for some real world racing conditions. And even that, the combination of different types of data that are important and making, it's not always one parameter. Sometimes it's a combination of different parameters. And when you, you put those together, you have an excellent combination. Again, when you look at Remco, he's small, he has big thighs, very small calves, and he's very aerodynamic. In every type of racing, he's almost the most aerodynamic rider in the peloton, and his absolute power output values are not the highest. When you look at the time trial, perhaps from 40 minutes, he can do 400 watts, and when you look at what, what Van Aert, he has to push 470 watts to reach an even pace. So that's the lack of those online platforms that they will never be able to incorporate this type of interaction with environment or other riders very correctly. But again, it can be fun to race, it can be fun to train. That, that's true. When you, even when you look at a sports like rowing, they're not very sophisticated, not yet. But there, you can use an argumentator to row on, to train. You can do it on the water. There's a difference in technique. But there are also competitions and world championships and world records on the ergometer. And then again, in Belgium, we have Wart Lamelein, world champion ergometer rowing. But it will take a lot of time to make him world champion on the water. So they can create added value to each other. But I'm not sure that virtual racing can replace the real stuff. Okay, look, staying with you, Edwin, look, streaming data can be crucial for fan experience and immersive viewing. So how valuable is this within the cycling industry? In fact, I forgot to tell earlier that we already use streaming data, even in our way of working. We use it in, for instance, time trialing to do the coaching of a rider. We use it in track cycling as a training facil facility, just create a local network where you can capture all the data from your rider and, and, and how he puts power to his bike. So you can, in real life, analyze training if allowed racing. So sure, it can be interesting to share some of these data with the broader public. But then again, it's important to look at it from the view of the public and not from the view of the analysis of the coach, because some of these parameters are interesting interesting for the coach, but not for a broader public, especially when you don't explain them correctly. And most of the time it's just on television and you have some journalist talking about data, not knowing what, what he's talking about. And then again, that's a tricky combination. You should create the right yeah, atmosphere or the right storytelling to incorporate data, some data in this life thing about racing. A yeah, open question for any of the rest of you in terms of like the utilization now of data on screen during live broadcast. Chris. Chris. Yeah. Um, 
I'm not too, I'm not too sure. I suppose for 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 the for the viewer to yeah, it will be depend on the quality of the person who's able to present that data. Um, I think that we, we it, that'll always be be key. Um, in England, you have the the match of the day. Um, it's, a, it's a famous program that's that's shown every Saturday and Sunday evening from all the games, and you have the former players who are all analysts who sit. And they, they they have researchers that go and pull all the footage for them. And then when we watch on a Saturday evening, we have these fancy diagrams and drawings and everything. But um, I, I think that the only the only value in that would be the, the the person if they're able to present that data correctly. And then the second thing I would say, like let's also not go away too much from the game. You know, let's let's try and enjoy enjoy the game. And, and, and what it brings and, and not overcomplicate it and, and keep things keep things like that minimal as you know I think I think um, the, the experience of football and the excitement still needs to remain and not everything needs to be analyzed. There's something important that everybody who works in data will know is that you know data only means something when you have large volumes of it. And if you want to suddenly analyze an action or something that's happened in the game, guess what? It could just be random. You know, it could, I could, the person could have reacted to that based on the reaction of the fullback or, you know, an, in another situation, they won't do that. So I wouldn't say I'm the biggest fan of that. I think it's a, a great example. I'm sure if all of you, when you watch football, there is the, the trend now of goal probability. I don't know if you're familiar with this. You see an action of a player in front of the goal and they give you, wow, 6% goal probability. And as a viewer, you watch and say, yeah, but this finish is a goal. How can it be 6%? And that's one of the examples of how confusing data can be. Who, who, who needs to know if it's 6 8 or 10% and who decides that the algorithm that you're using? And that's a little bit one of the examples. 70% of goal probability and the keeper save it. Well, if it's Thibaut Courtois, it's very different to have another keeper in front of you. So I think data can be fun. They can use it. But it's very much the other way around, when you got a process and the help. And I always love a relationship, a human relationship. Data in itself, uh, I don't think it's valuable. If I say to you, I want to become, I'm going to become uh, as good as someone, and you tell me, well, the data is, this is the journey that you need to, to, to achieve, that's, that's very valuable. But it needs to be a commitment data on its own without commitment, without relationship. And that's what I found in, in elite sport, the data that it gets the biggest emphasis is the one that is behind a human relationship. Or you want to uh, build the best possible squad. you got a dream, you got a, an emotion, and then you use data to achieve that. Anything else that is just data driven by data is very shallow, it, it's got no meaning. I, I fully agree. I think I think in individual sports, and it, it relates to this uh, human relation, there's some f very basic data that are very interesting for, for people. And just a small anecdote, but in my previous job, I was the meeting director of Memorial Van Damme. We had the honor to have the king next to me. And every race, he asked me, how quick is that? And I said, well, 11 on the 100 or, no, no, speed per hour. That's what people want to know. And now with all the data analysis, Omega Swiss Timing is one of the leading companies in the world in the Olympic space. It's just super interesting to see how quick is that? How fast is the shot on, on a goal? That, that's the kind of data that's interesting for people to compare, to dream of, wow, he runs 32 kilometers per hour on average on one lap. Whoa, that's quick. And, and how far does a skier jump in, in the downhill in Kidsbull? And I think those things make it fun and make it make even the, the wow factor of the performances of our top athletes even, even more uh, astonishing. And, and, and that's, that's cool. But if we make it too technical, like Roberto says, or with statistics or very much in the American model, I think we, we, we lose the fun of the game. It's painful to watch an NFL game with everything coming up on the screen. <laughs> yeah, look, so obviously the, the, the US has a very different view, but, and, it, and look, it sort of probably leans in and segues perfectly to that view around sports betting and the utilization of data on screen of an athlete, of a performance in relation to the, the betting companies, the stat companies that are you are working with. Well, that's a game changer. Huh? We're all talking about data and data and data. The, I, I believe that the usage of data is going to be challenged very soon. Uh, it's at the moment, every athlete is almost used its data to move around and to use it. I think it's going to be, I think it's been a case, if I'm not wrong, with cricket 
in the UK that they already agreed with the players to own that data. So they are the ones that they sell in that data uh, publicly. So if that goes, it transfers in bigger sports, uh, I think we, we're talking about a big, big before and after of how you use data and who's available to use data and, and well, what's going to be the impact on, on, on the technology that is surrounding the sport now. Yeah, that probably could be an entire panel on its own in terms of like the ability of like how powerful is the athlete going to be in the future in being able to determine what information they're prepared to give themselves. Well, uh, you're talking about, you said betting. Uh, the problem is when you always get uh, a profit. Uh, now betting industry in the UK makes around 600 million pounds a year. Out of what? Out of data of players. Now that's gonna, it's not going to be accepted to be just okay. The betting uh, companies are going to take that money away from the game. So it's, it's going to be a challenge and it will be a setback to the technology around it, without a doubt. Uh, so you mentioned there from the Memorial Van Damme, um, obviously you were utilized, you, you know, from that perspective as well, and, an, and at an event you have to utilize data from a ticket perspective in terms of driving an attendance to that event. So how were, were you utilizing data in regards to ticket pricing, ticket churn, and how important that was to drive that audience back in? Well, obviously, also there was still a, gr a growing process. We were not as evolved as I think I would say in the Anglo-Saxon world. Uh, I know, especially in UK, fan relationship management has been there for a very long time on how everything is measured and integrated also with the cash system and uh, the spending of uh, the fans. Um, so we've just gotten, gotten started, I think, in this in, in Belgium and also at Memorial Van Damme. So we wouldn't change our ticket price, but we would really uh, try to drive ticket sales to certain groups, knowing what is our audience, uh, in what periods of the of the year do you target them? Do you target more families with young kids, which is really what was our audience or is still the audience of the Memorial Van Dam, uh, or target other people? And there we use data, try to gather data every time after every uh, event, but it's only once a year, so it goes pretty slow. But we try to learn from other events, from events in the uh, in, abroad, and even from uh, colleagues in the football. So, but uh, I think. In general, if I see, and as I said, I was a bit in the CRM space in uh, sports CRM systems, we're very much behind here in Belgium compared to uh, especially the Anglo-Saxon world. Okay, look, right, we've got one question left, which is, I'm going to pose it to each of you, which is really a bit of a wide question of like, right, what do you see as the future of the data analytics uh, sort of moving forward? So, Roberto, I'll start with you. I think ideally you're a bit biased and you're looking at your own future. What I would love to see is if I have a young player and I want to be a midfielder, I need to know the data of Kevin De Bruyne and how as a young player I can be shown what I should be achieving every year from a physical, from a technical, from a tactical point of view so I can have my own motivation and my own desire to become as good as I can. I think data, again, when you, when you look at that emotion that a young player, a young girl that he wants to play football, not knowing how, not knowing how to get the best out of you, I think if data can give you that plan, that's, that will be, uh, uh, that will be the, future, the future way of working in sport. Okay, Cedric? Well, I'll just build on that on the second phase of your career. How can you extend your career? How can you make sure uh, when you're a more experienced athlete, or player, and, and we see a lot of great examples already, how can you make sure you don't get injured, you can get the best out of yourself with less, uh, well, less effort is not the, the, the exact correct words, but with the smart effort, let, let's say like this, and learn more and more from that. I'm sure that we can, a lot of athletes are burned up way too early by not utilizing their body in the right way, because they don't know the right data, or they have the data, but they don't interpret it correctly. Thank you, Erwin. Yeah, it was mentioned in the session before when we could have insight in everything what happens between our ears and have a little bit of data to quantify it that would be beneficial but maybe it gets very complicated so on the other hand i think a part of the future of using data in elite sport is just keep it simple and try to understand what data you are working with and, and don't get lost in whatever is available and chris uh, in terms of football, I think it's um, it's the tracking data uh, off the ball action. So at the moment, we obviously have all on ball actions. I think it's going to be pretty important because one of the hardest things in in uh, making an analysis of a player, are, for example, defenders. Um, it's very easy to 
to to decide players on the ball how good they are because yeah you know, it's, it's what they generally do with the ball but defenders spend most of the time without the ball and i think tracking data once it can be done it cannot you need cameras you need access all around the world but once we can see what uh, defenders do with their distances without the ball i think it can be very interesting for future recruitment and make it stronger Super, thank you. I think we've got time for one question from the audience, if anyone has a question for our esteemed panel. Oh, right at the top, Erwin. You have to scream. Uh, I've got a question. Um, do you uh, educate all your trainers to uh, have knowledge about getting a lot of data and make sure it's important in your situation to your model? That's certainly an important point. Education of all of your performance stuff to know how to communicate about data, to know how to deal with data, and certainly to know how to score an evolution of an athlete over time based on data. Yeah, for us in football is uh, is following, let's say, a game model that has got 20 concepts. Now you adding the data, what is good and a bad concept. Before yours, a good concept is my opinion. As a coach, I'm looking at you as a player, that's good, that's bad now. It's like that KPI is going to give you that's good and that's bad. It's completely objective. And that's what we're trying to promote. We don't, we don't promote coaches that become technological coaches. We want the coach to be the coach that he uses the feeling and the experience and the know-how. Then to determine what's good and bad, that should be data, if that makes sense. OK, uh, one last question here. I can ask. Uh, my experience is yes, we do. Uh, I would say probably 10%. And the reason is not that they don't like technology, it's they don't like change. So there's a lot of people, a lot of athletes that they believe in what they do and the routine. And to wear something or to feel that someone's eyes are on your performance, sometimes you're not feeling comfortable. So what we do is try to educate them to change. And the benefits of technology. Um, we often leave those players, no, you don't have to be involved with technology. And then when one day a question is, how can I become quicker? How can I become, how can I play? Why am I on the bench? Well, you need to reach this. The only way to measure it is in this way. And then is when the, the athlete always, always will be open to change if it's something beneficial. But in general, uh, sports people are creatures of habits. They don't like change. So it's quite high, the percentage of people that they're very open. I think the new generation now, they're very open. I remember 15 years ago, uh, it would be 10% that they would use the available heart rates and GPS. 10% of a group of 20. Two players. Now it's the other way around. It will have one or two that they got a reason why they don't want to use it. Chris, do you have anything to add? Yeah, a little bit the same. Um, definitely when it first started, for, for us here in Belgium a few years ago, for, what, five, six years ago, players were were resisting it a little bit. Um, but now it, it's it's kind of become the norm through education, um, good physical coaches engaging with the players, making them understand um, the benefits, also not complicating it, delivering easy messages to, to, to understand and digest for the players, and sometimes also making it competitive. Okay, that wraps up the panel. Thanks very much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.